Hello, Yes But Why listeners. This is your host, Amy Jordan. Welcome to Yes But Why, episode 246, my chat with Australian artists Asia Beck and Ben Snaith. But first, let's chat about our sponsors. Today's episode is sponsored by Audible. Get your free audiobook download and your 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com forward slash yes but why. You guys, taking long drives is how I am staying sane these days, and Audible is right there with me helping to distract my mind from whatever stress I'm cooling off from. I've read novels, self-help books, poetry books, and recently I listened to this recording of a live show with Common called Bluebird Memories. That was truly amazing. It felt like I was in the theater. I needed that. Audible is available on most of the devices in your home. Go now to audibletrial.com forward slash yes but why to download the app and sign up to get your free audiobook today. Maybe you need it too. Our other sponsor for today's episode is my company, podcastcadet.com. My husband, Chris Jordan, and I run the company, podcastcadet.com. We provide advice and production help to anyone who needs it. We do one-on-one consultations. We have prefab videos to help with specific issues like what audio equipment to use or best practices for interviewing. We can give you a little push or we can help you with the production of all of your episodes. Contact us now at podcastcadet.com and use code YBY20 to get 20% off the first service or workshop you buy podcastcadet.com, helping creators navigate the waters of podcasting. This week on Yes But Why, we chat with Australian improv duo Asia Beck and Ben Snaith. In our conversation, we talk about performing improv and building your own performance style. We talk about their recent duo show, Ben and Asia Have a Relationship, which they performed totally naked. Whoa. I now present to you Yes, But Why, episode 246, Asia Beck and Ben Snaith on vulnerability through improv. Enjoy. I'm Amy Jordan, and this is Yes, But Why podcast. Yeah. My first question for you guys is when you guys were little, were you always performing for your family? And, you know, if not, like, what was the first experience of performing where you were like, oh, yeah, this is my jam? Mm, Yeah, I was I feel like I was pretty much always like putting on like magic shows for my family and their friends. And, um, you know, I I have this memory of being like, family you know in interstate and um like for some reason doing like a recital of all these different dance styles that I actually had never trained in um but presented to this like family of uncles and aunties who I was only meeting for like the second or first time and like I remember doing like Michael Flatley style like Lord of the Dance and um <laughs> And like, just like ballet um, and yeah, and yeah, little styles of dance that, yeah, I didn't actually know. And, but they were all really nice about it. And um, yeah, and then I guess all through um, my primary and high school, I was finding like little opportunities to get up on stage. And um, yeah, I think especially as like a teenager, I really fell in with like, um, being that sort of like, uh, you know, kind of like emotional teen who would be like writing poetry and writing songs and stuff in my room, like um, sort of fumbling around with a guitar. And um, yeah, so I guess like on that kind of level, I was just sort of really just loved doing it. But also, you know, my family was very much like, 
you know, well, it's like one in a million, you making a career out of it, <laughs> you know, like there's no way of you doing that kind of thing. And um, I don't know, just like, <laughs> you know, like dad just kind of being like, oh, yeah, still singing, huh? <laughs> like, yeah, okay, well, you know. Oh, man. And so like, I mean, it was, yeah, like it took, it feels like it, it took a little while before my, my dad, especially, like, I remember when I was about 19 or, and that was starting to get a bit of cred around the city. And, um, and he came to one of those shows. And I remember, like, you know, there was this older person there who I think going up to my dad and being like, oh, your son is a genius. <laughs> and, like, and it was kind of, it took other people before my dad was like, oh, okay, well, this is what he really does want to do. And it's not completely crazy. You know, um, I will support him then, you know, by showing up and not really ever giving any much feedback or, or you know, him just being like, well, I was here. I was here. Um, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes that's all you can ask for, right? Yeah, that's all I need. Like, um, the one of my bands, we had a dancing dad start dancing because it was mostly like live bootleg recordings and during one of these, like this real wild show, the crowd like up and I could see right at the back of the room, see my dad and his friend just standing there. <laughs> and I was holding the microphone. And I was just like, start dancing, dad, start dancing. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and yeah, that, that like came through really clearly in the recording <laughs> and it was really funny. And um yeah, so I guess it's been this interesting path where I've like gradually become more and more confident with just being like, this is, I literally am this, like, this is what I do. And this, I just, I'm a performer and an artist and I'm just like this. And, you know, as I'm getting some stuff, my, all of my family and stuff, I'm just been less and less apologetic about it. Like I used to be like, oh yeah, well, you know, I'm doing this thing, but I'm also studying, I'm studying, like... <laughs> You know, but now I just am kind of like, no, no. Yeah. Got to show on. Show's on. Yeah. I mean, once you make the decision for the lifestyle that you want to lead, like <laughs> your family can be like, oh, I don't understand that. And you're like, yeah, I, I know what you went through, so I can see why you don't. But that's fine. That's what I'm doing. It's all totally. right. It really took me moving to like a whole other state and another city to be able to find that sense of confidence like I, I grew up up where we are now in, uh the state is called Queensland and it's okay. like this real it's really big but it's kind of like I from what I understand about America it's kind of like Florida like it's like beachy and <laughs> like um you know it sort of has a bit of a trashy vibe to it like and there's like gators if you go up north and <laughs> like you know it's yeah there's it's kind of a I don't know it, it, it's is that like why the, your stage name was Orlando Furious? You had like a real Florida vibe? <laughs> <laughs> no, like Orlando no? Furious. No, no, that was like a, um, it was about eight years ago. I was having a drink with a friend and he was telling, he was a very literary guy. Like he just knew heaps about old literature. And for some reason he was just ranting to me about this old like 16th century Italian poem called Orlando Furioso. And the title character was just this like total wild card who just, you know, he like lost his wits at one point because the woman he loved eloped and like his wits ended up on the moon and his friend had to ride this like Gryffindor up to the moon to like get his wits back in a bottle. <laughs> Insane wow. story. And I was like, you know what? I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna take that, <laughs> take that like final O off the end. So it's like not like an Italian thing so much. <laughs> That's way yeah. better than you being like, I went on a trip to Orlando, Florida, <laughs> and I got real mad. And it was, <laughs> I was like, I'm <laughs> Yeah, totally. Yeah. But it's been, um, yeah, the, it's been a really nice, fun kind of like journey with doing that stuff. Like I've, I've toured pretty hard as like a solo kind of musician like I used to describe what I did as sort of like a backyard Kanye like it was kind of like big <laughs> and big ego but like sort of backyard and Australian and like you know very suburb like um kind of very suburban and like uh 
I don't know, like there was just a bit of cheese. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Kanye West <laughs> won 70,000 votes in the recent election. Just so wow. I mean, legit. <laughs> He's pretty uh, legit. The, yeah, is that like point zero of the <laughs> yeah. of a percent of the population? Though? <laughs> Definitely, it's like it's like yeah. the population of the smallest town. <laughs> they're just we're all like, let's do it. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> yeah. I saw. I read somewhere that he like didn't get his like paperwork in on time. I <laughs> thought so too. That's why I was like, you know what? Though people can write in whatever they want, so people could yeah. be. He doesn't have to put in his paperwork and people could have voted for him, so whatever. Yeah. Well, that's like, more than I got. <laughs> it's, it was a ridiculous amount. But hey, what I'm saying is Kanye is popular with certain people, just like oh, you. Totally. <laughs> I mean, I, I sort of stopped. The reason why I say I used to do it was because when he went that kind of bit Margo, like, I was a bit like, oh, <laughs> I don't know if I'm aligning myself with this <laughs> anymore. But it was such a good show hand for explaining what I was doing like it was like oh okay now I understand you're just going to be a bit of a weirdo and jump on the table maybe um, yeah definitely yeah. definitely yeah. don't let him near couches in Oprah it'll be terrible <laughs> yeah. Exactly, exactly. oh yeah. my goodness so we were you you mentioned something about uh when you were performing your music um you said that you were touring a lot and you had mentioned uh, we went down a bit of a uh, a rabbit hole talking about uh, queensland but um mm. you said you lived in a different place and now you're yeah. so like I now mean, you feel more yourself because you get to be in your own place Pretty much, yeah. I moved um, I moved with a band, like, say, about, I don't know, 12 years ago now, down to a city called Melbourne, which is um, the, like, the New York of, like, it's where, like, a lot of the art and the music scene kind of is. And it's where, like, you know, it's very cool to be, like, just sort of dressed in black and, you know, you're very, like, there's like a thriving theater scene and it's, it's lovely it's my I love that city and a bit, it was this awesome place to just kind of you know try heaps of stuff out and like you know I treated it like pretty much one massive open mic night you could play like heaps of different places I found myself in this kind of underground theater scene as well and like um you know, it was really formative to be able to see people who were kind of like further along in their artistic progression than I was and, you know, have people to kind of look towards either for, you know, future inspiration or also as like, um, you know, uh, cautionary tales, <laughs> you know, of what not to do potentially. Um, and yeah, and so I was living there for about eight or nine years. And when I finished my teaching degree, I like moved back to Queensland just to try and get to know my family again, because I really had basically just been like, oh, I'm going to be an artist and just basically abandoned them. And, you know, I had all this guilt about like leaving my sister. So I kind of, I sort of moved back with the intention of getting to know them better. Um, and it's kind of happened, but also I'm also now living about an hour away from them. So <laughs> an hour is a manageable amount though yeah, like it's like close enough that you can hours. go yeah like you can go there you can get there well if you need to but mm. you don't have to like this show uh, no I, it was surprising because my family members came like mm. which is bizarre absolutely bizarre but um but I don't but none of Ben's family, I think, would be able to handle the material at all, like in any way. <laughs> I I think they'd have to walk. I think they they wouldn't be able to handle being in the whole sh like seeing watching the whole show. I don't think I, don't I could invite anyone except for my mother to any improv. Never mind naked mm. improv yeah <laughs> so i mean my mom just sits there and smiles and goes like mm, 
very nice. So, I mean, who knows what she really thinks, but my sister would never sit through it. She'd be yeah, like, right. what? And she'd leave immediately, you know? Wow. Like, it's just not her scene, you know, not in a mean right. way, not in a like, oh God, who are these terrible people? But just like, <laughs> I don't, I'm going to just hang out front and I'll see you after. Like, yeah. you know. Uh it's not their yeah, scene you know as much as i might try and drag them to certain stuff or like you know if i made it clear that it was really important but i kind of knew that when we were devising this show and when we made the decision to go naked for it i was like well that pretty much like you know <laughs> my my dad my mom and my sister are probably not going to come to this um mm. but that was totally fine because it, they weren't really the audience that we were you know, aiming for. Right. With my family, I'm kind of like, um, no, this is just not your thing at all. So I don't, I don't want anybody at the show who's just going to be there because, yeah, for no, absolutely. for no reason. Like, I don't, I, I just don't like that at all. <laughs> like, yeah, so, yeah, so, so, do you ever sort of feel like when your dad does come, it's like, ugh. Why Why are you even here? That's how it is now. Like, there was a show that I played in Adelaide one time um, with my music at, and Adelaide is, like, in a completely other city again. And um, it, my dad just happened to be staying there for a while because he was working, and it, we went out for dinner beforehand, and he ended up getting, like, really drunk with some of his friends. And then it led to, like, when I finally went on at around 11 o'clock or whatever, dad sort of had come in and was like standing next to the speaker like bobbing his head and stuff <laughs> and i was like no my dad's here and like and the crowd was all like <laughs> crazy and um that was actually really lovely yeah that was actually oh. that was, yeah so that was nice but um That's nice i've never seen him bob his head like ever <laughs> <laughs> Right. I mean, they're not all dads are into bobbin heads. Plus, right. think about how much older he is than me. Bob and his yeah. head hurt him. You don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you could so, be like, yeah. ow, 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 ow. It's just like not a good yeah. Oh, Tell yeah. You. Yeah. yeah. Not all the parts work. Dads would love to nod. <laughs> there, they got a whole, there's whole Facebook groups. Dads who wish they could nod. Like, it's like all, all <laughs> subculture. But no, sorry. Yeah. We'll find his views together. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, Asia, tell me a little bit about your beginnings. What was the first, you know, performance <laughs> stuff that you got into? Was it uh... early in life or was it later? <laughs> um, Ah, we could just talk about Ben on this thing, you know, like we could just do that. (laughs) We could totally do that. Um, Did you have uh, a traumatic first uh, um, performance? Was it really terrible? What? Well, no. Well, look. uh, It's more like the um, general upbringing was kind of traumatic. And from what I understand, sorry, Asia. But it it seems like performance is like the thing that has been the the light. Yeah, it has been really cathartic. The performance itself has been really cathartic for me. Um, always, always, hands down, always. I would like to say stay in the performance space and just live there forever and just not ever be in the real world because it's so um, transportive for me. Performing is that it's so much more comfortable than being in real life. Um, it's funny because ooh, I, yesterday I did an audition to get into my master's, which at the end of the day, um, the master's, the head of master's of bachelor of music uh, or master's of music is uh, an, a, an old teacher of mine that I went to from, uh, I was going to her from when I was about 10 or 11 um, and it was just bizarre because I, I hadn't, I haven't performed in, in over 10 years. And this show was like the first show that had actually ever done a public performance. Um, it's been more than 10 years actually since I've performed publicly. Um, but then she was, she just sort of throws, 
she she said it a couple of times. She's like, oh yeah, because Ben was in the room. Um, ben is officially my carer, uh, and and my bass player Ruben was in the room too. Um, and she goes, yeah, yeah, because you know she was a child prodigy. And I was like, what? <laughs> what are you talking about? I just don't see myself in that light at all. Um, and I was made to perform from a very young age. Um, so I guess... It's kind of like you're a child prodigy because you were essentially whipped into performing. <laughs> <laughs> which I think... Which I, which I, yeah. um, but, no. but I think even before they knew I could sing... Uh, and perform and um, before they knew I could captivate people's attention I knew that I could hear things that other people couldn't hear Um, and I could understand emotions that other people were a little bit blunt to Um, I remember I have memories from when I was you know three uh, remembering sounds and, and tone patterns and and the deep feelings associated with with sound um, that and that was there before anyone could beat me into anything, you know. Um, so it's been a and when they say you know gifted, it's a gift, but it's a curse as well when you when you have to live in society um, and 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 you're you're sort of bent against other people's control and will. And they'll do what they want with you because you're just a child. Um, but yeah, it's uh, uh, <laughs> so. Uh, I guess uh, I don't know. What do you? Wh- where do I even begin? It's um, yeah. It's a it's a long story. But does that give you a bit more? <laughs> That's terrible. Sure, absolutely. I mean, you don't ever have to talk about anything that makes you uncomfortable at all. It's no, really I... just a, a door into how it got started for you. But mm. the idea that it got started for you and was tarnished by yucky adults um, yeah. trying to get their, you know, trying to get cash payment for it or whatnot, <laughs> um, yeah. notoriety. That's, like religious that gratification. Yeah. Yeah. So I grew, I grew up in a, in what is a religious was until the cult leader died in, in a religious cult. And they were, they were extreme for what some people would classify the extreme sort of churches. And it was fundamental Christian Christianity, but like we had a prophet, and Jesus was going to come back every Wednesday. We were supposed to wait for him, you know. And then if it didn't happen that week, it was going to happen the next week or the next week, you know. And we had we had we had tin beans in the cupboard, and we had um, bottled water and you know gallons of water. And we lived on acreage, and we had a farm and stuff because. And uh, my parents had given up on education and taken us out and, and quote unquote homeschooled us while they worked full time. Um, but we were essentially just going out under a tree and waiting for Jesus to come back. Um, and in, in the, in the process, I, because I know they knew I could sing and I had a gift um, for communicating musically. Um, yeah. There was, there was a lot of like salvation to be made and other people brought into the fold um to become sheep (laughs) which is which is something I'm really not proud of at all um I I don't Mm. like the the judgment I don't like what everything I was taught to represent and everything that I ended up believing quite vehemently um just as a as a child as a kid and and just holding yeah and sort of holding holding harsh judgment about other humans just very, very harsh judgment, but being so swept, um, swept up by music, just music itself. It can be any kind of music, you know, um, and you can get something um, profound out of it. It they used it to <laughs> they they used it for their own. I don't know what I'm trying to say. 
They, no, absolutely. They need- I, I totally get what you're saying. I mean, there are, I, I, what you're talking about makes me think of some of the like child actors or child pop stars that yeah. I'm aware of whose parents like took their money and then like spent it all. And then like they're adults and they literally were the most like, what, what it, somebody was just talking about like Britney Spears, like Britney mm-hmm. Spears has nothing right now. And mm-hmm. she like has like legal documents where she can't actually even perform without like, or like, go on dates without her parents like permission and she's legit in her mid 30s if not early 40s like mm, that's super weird so like i just heard about that you know Mm. i feel like once you become a celebrity then the idea of that is your agency is taken away from you because Mm. like you're a commodity and so your commodification means that you don't have the same rights as other people and so the people who make money off of you can do what they want and it happens to lots Mm. of people you know i'm sure that like there's plenty of you know celebrities we look at and are like oh man they must be so happy and really they're Mm. just like signing checks all day being like i wish i could do anything else like who knows you know and i mean lots of celebrity you know and the and like you know, more what we would just describe as cults. Like there, there's such an overlap between, you know, (laughs) like especially what I imagine for like a child to be raised in, you know, a sort of a very like sectioned off little community that, you know, was so rigid and so intense kind of thing. Like I feel like the same sort of mania exists around celebrity culture as it does within like these sort of small little like communities that are secluded on these little properties and you don't even know what's going on there kind of thing I guess at least in celebrity culture there's a there's a semblance of accountability because the media is so willing to just be like oh Britney Spears blah, blah. you know like they're willing to bring so much light to it kind of thing but mm. yeah I think it's so crazy in like the you know to just have my eyes open in recent times to just the sheer amount of really intense religious cults that are existing just in our, you know, like Asia grew up, like that was happening sort of 50 kilometers from where I was growing up, you know, in this kind of normal, you know, quote unquote normal sort of suburban. It's, um, it's really, it's, it's, it's been kind of like intense and, yeah, to understand the depths of the control that was going on, like, and manipulation. Mm. Um, yeah, it's been really intense. Yeah. But, um, Hard too that they took away the joy of music from you. You know that they made it perfunctory for their purposes, and then it sort of lost the luster um, and the beauty that it had for you how asia did you i mean clearly you found your way out of that cult i guess thankfully because the guy passed away i'm not sure (laughs) how i feel about all that and also the whole experience of everything you went through but as you got older did you what was the experience that allowed you to get back into it i imagine rightfully so that you would be like no thank you i won't be singing or performing anymore um and i get that but now you're performing again how did you get back into it well <laughs> i had uh, i spent a bit of time escaping the cult even before the leader was dead um i got married to get out and get away from my family um and married somebody else who was from a similar ideology, um, so it was acceptable. But uh, had a major mental breakdown in the process, and realised uh, after being hospitalised for you know twelve months, and then you know in and out of hospital. Um, but I realised, um, or they realised, the doctors did who got me off a bridge and, and, um, you know, essentially rescued me on one level, um, that, that I was, that I was suffering from, uh, 
a disease, really. Um, and I just spent a lot of time trying to trying to survive and trying to f- find uh, because I'd left my family and I'd um, I'd essentially oh god I'd, I'd fallen through the cracks well and truly um, but one thing that I had begged my parents um, when I when I was 16 to to, to let me go back to school. Um, so because musically I was, I was gifted and I could read music somehow. And, I, you know, I was, I still ended up getting high school education. And then I, I ended up going to university and doing bachelor of music, um, okay. back when I was still, back when I was still, you know, 18, 19, 20, um, and finished that off when I was married, but I was, I was very unbalanced. <laughs> I was a very, and everybody would just put it down to sort of the devil, you know, the devil is tempting you to whatever, um, which sure. was not helpful, was not helpful at all. Um, and uh, it, how did I get back into it? I, I, I don't really know. <laughs> I, I mean, I think... practi- practically, uh, we, uh, I went to, you know, there's always been this thing where I'm like, I know that I love this. I know that I want this. I like to perform. I like to create things. And, and I was just, you know, I was only in my 20s and I was already, but there was something inside of me that was like make something. So I went to improv theater classes and I met Ben there. And um, and uh, thankfully I was off medication that was, I mean, medication is imperfect at the best of times. Um, I'm not a huge advocate either way for being off or on medication when you have uh, a, a serious that distorts your idea of reality um i i just think it's hard life is really hard you know um if you don't have your if you don't have logical mind to navigate safety it's just been a disaster (laughs) somehow somehow i i got myself to improvise classes and uh i met an amazing community of supportive people and was able to sort of fake being relatively normal. Um, (laughs) (laughs) um, And then just finding the right people. I've heard it said before, you know, in other interviews that, you know, it's, you just got to meet the right people and it sounds stupid and simple, but it's really true. Um, I met Ben and then soon after we were, you know, we were, we were dating and, um, and we just fell into a routine that, um, where we were creating, we were creating stuff just all the time. Um, and it's been, how long has it been? It's not been that long. No, it's only been a little bit over a year. Um, we, yeah, we met in, um, idiot improv class with, uh, um, the theater with, that we work with here called Big Fork Theater, and they're like made up by these amazing um, group of directors who, you know, um, I guess when they all started, they all met by going over to like train at the Improv Olympic and um, in Chicago, and they like had all this sort of um, experience with like you know really wanting to follow the path of like Del Close like you know the truth and comedy kind of oh. long form improv style interesting and um and we just like I you know I know for myself I went to the foundations class and I was like hooked and then before you know it I'm going through the intermediate classes it's kind of like um you know, it's sort of a wild element to the class, you know, because she would just sort of come in and be this like sort of just a, a, an energy that you couldn't really pick, you know, you couldn't like just immediately put your finger on it. And um, 
And she came to me with the idea of us starting like a little sketch group with some of other people who were also in the class. And so, you know, we started meeting on Sundays and um, trying to write sketches and trying to figure out how to, you know, try and figure out our own little path of improvising. And, um, you know, and from there, like that was around when we started dating and um, like we just yeah, like I just said, we, you know, we've worked on like music videos together for the Orlando Furious project. And like, we've, um, you know, just formed a lot with Big Folk Theatre together. And, um, Mm. and the, yeah, and then this show that we've just um, kind of been devising for the past eight weeks, like, um, that was us, like, you know, just trying to, there's been a couple of the directors that have been off doing like duo shows lately and we were like ah duo you can just do it with two people you know and like being in (laughs) lockdown and stuff with the coronavirus um Mm. you know you've well it is literally just the two of us here like you know we're gonna have to just do it on our own and um yeah and so we started kind of figuring out what you know, what we could kind of get towards. And the more that we were sort of jamming on, like, you know, working out little scenes together and stuff, like figuring out how we would do it, the more we wanted it to be sort of blurring the lines of reality and and being leaning into being vulnerable about our like me with my anxiety and, you know, and depression and all of that sort of stuff and Asia with her schizophrenia and her background and stuff. And we wanted to, you know, um, recently Asia was on a, um, like a improvise, like a people of colour improvisers, like panel, um, mm-hmm. you know, this discussion that was on, a, it was like a Zoom stream kind of thing. And um, and on that, like, you know, they were just, they were talking there was a big message of like feeling of people of color in our improv community feeling like if they were to make reference to their, their background that, you know, the people who were kind of, they would more likely to get wiped. You know what I mean? Like they were more likely if they, because there were, there were all those concerns about like, Oh, you know, don't, what is this racism? Are we being like, what is the, <laughs> you know, when um, say like an Indian p- improviser was, would to put on an Indian accent, you know, like a, like a most Indian accent, for instance, you know, um, they were talking about this feeling of wanting to explore these kind of cultural ideas, but not, but feeling silenced and stuff. And so when we started devising our show, it was very much like we weren't going to really have the option to wipe kind of thing. It was essentially going to be like an hour, essentially a mono scene kind of thing. Um, but then we, we gradually kind of tweaked the format over time as we were rehearsing it. Um mm. But yeah, it's been a really interesting journey this past like year or so. Like I feel like I've only been studying and performing improv for yeah, it must be about eighteen months because I would have met Asia at sort of the sixth, you know, like mm. a couple a few months in. And um, wow! Yeah. So you guys created this show. You said mm. you're working with directors. What's the style like is it sketch in that you've written stuff ahead of time or are you doing (laughs) improv with a um with a form like like Harold but not Harold yeah yeah um so I guess the way that we thought about it was we lacked this idea of exploring a relationship you know like an intimate relationship and you know the stages of a relationship, you know, like, you know, maybe one scene could be like when this couple first met, but like maybe the next scene could be when um, this couple is like in their sixties or, you know, you know what I mean? Like they um, mm-hmm. we wanted it to be essentially the, the initial idea was that it was like four stages, like, and they could be, in order, out of order, whatever, like one of us would just kind of make the offer and we would make it clear like where we were, when we were in the context of our relationship, what had sort of changed, what had evolved, what, you know. Um, 
and yeah, and it was basically it would be kind of four fifteen minute scenes essentially um, that um, we just so we would just start doing these kind of jams to like a fifteen minute timer where we would just play out like a you know essentially be Ben and Asia, but you know, just kind of like an abstraction of yeah, a bit of an of abstraction past, of present, like, and future. Yeah, and like bringing in things that ha- might have occurred in like previous relations, you know, and and sort of kind of mining those like reflections for content for this. The way that it's kind of ended up, it has been basically um, to give you just like an idea of what our show has the um, for the past three nights has been um, basically. We come out, we have our friend Ruben playing an upright bass and he's so he's pro, kind of giving the the jazz, the time, the, you know, this the sense of gravitas that a big double brings. Mm. Completely, um, you know, cur- black curtains, black floor kind of thing and just a couple of spotlights. And then we've just like turned on the lights and gone like, you know, we're doing this thing on intimate relationships. We just want to sort of start a little discussion about any sort of patterns that you might have seen emerge in an intimate relationship over your life. You know, like what's something that is a reason why the relationship fails or why it succeeds kind of thing. And we've had these little discussions with the audience just to kind of flesh out the idea. And we sort of let that sit within ourselves. And then we've hit the play button on um, the William Tell Overture. Um, <laughs> yeah. and we, we had this like choreographed dance to that that basically culminated in like the ugliest strip scene <laughs> where like we're just <laughs> getting dragged by the shoe around the stage and stuff and like it's just kind of ridiculous and silly and um and it was a really nice way to kind of just warm the audience into the nudity because <laughs> you know we knew we were leaning into vulnerability and I guess that's the ultimate in being really vulnerable on stage as opposed to just improvising for an hour just you and another person you know is to be completely naked and Wait, um, say that again you chose to be naked because it's like the ultimate vulnerability yeah pretty much like i know like for myself it was a, a you know i was i would have been comfortable just with underwear <laughs> you know <laughs> um and but then it was just kind of like no like because literally with this content that we're trying to like sift through i guess um in this context yeah this, we needed to be naked we had to be just completely naked and just be like well here this is who we are this is <laughs> this is ourselves this is us kind of thing mm. um and that was kind of how i got to it like i know asia got to she was really pushing that idea from a different perspective and um and yeah but that was kind of where we we ended up with it okay, we're going to do this big, silly way of getting completely naked in front of the audience. And then basically just kind of pop a moment in this relationship, you know, and the dynamic is kind of developed. And then, um, yeah, (laughs) then um, I guess the way that the show would kind of go from there is after maybe that scene went on for about 10, 12 minutes or so, we would just kind of like melt down and and um, we would sort of give ourselves a break from improvising by Asia would do like a song with um, the double bass in accompaniment. And that would just be sort of a jazz standard kind of song. Mm-hmm. So it was really beautiful having these kind of contrasts of like these improvising scenes then with a, um, yeah. And then with these like beautiful, like jazz singing, you know, kind of moments and like for that time, special golden gloves to kind of signal you know this was <laughs> like a you know a single spotlight kind of moment kind of thing for her mm. and um yeah so it was about two scenes of that and then um th- we decided on the third scene being like a like a primordial like a like caveman scene like where we had to really physicalize 
the kind of underlying I guess themes or vibes that had been brought up mm. and um and that that was like really insane like some of those got really wild where we were like sort of screaming at each other or like you know um or and grunting they were in these like really strange like slow dances together and stuff like it was yeah some of the responses that we got were just like Jesus that was like I have not seen anything like that like and that came more from my like physical theater training I suppose like Mm -hmm. wanting to wanting to find that um a bit more and um yeah and then the final scene was us just kind of emerging having like just gone through a massive journey (laughs) together we want to a happy ending just because um we found in some rehearsals when we didn't have that rule, the parallel version of our relationship would like break up <laughs> and it was, <laughs> then we would just at home have like two days of just kind of aftercare <laughs> and try mm, and yeah. reassure the other Getting one that sad. like we weren't leaving. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, you guys talk about the group that you started doing improv with as being, um, you know, focused on chicago style improv this sounds Mm. a little bit more serious than that less jokey jokey let's do fun time um herald play and more like deep dive into emotional stuff do you do you have a coach or a director that like led you through that or was that just the two of you working together i think you know we were starting and we we really don't have you know we're we're quite connected to our community um so we invited um a a host of different people from either the physical theater community or the improvisation community but um a lot of it was just self-worked stuff Um, it totally was yeah yeah um and we just kind of would ask like whoever we got to come along to a rehearsal and we would just we would sort of ask them the specific questions that we wanted answered as the person sort of looking in, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, And we were really deliberate about who we chose. Like we knew that like within, yeah, within Big Fork, like there are people who probably are going to be like, where's the jokes guys, (laughs) you know, Mm -hmm. like Mm -hmm. where's the bits and like, but there's also (laughs) other people who are like really, really receptive to it and really, You know, Mm -hmm. like we were really happy that like on, you know, Tuesday night, like all of the directors came to that show and they were all really supportive. I'm I'm so glad to be a part of this like community of people. Yeah. Surprisingly, they were, they, they were, they were impressed. (laughs) They, they were, um, you know, it isn't what our theatre, our uh, theatre company is focused on at the moment, you know, deep, the deep expression of sickness of separation or uh, the anxieties of love, um, our humanity, the depths of our humanity. And that's not the focus of the theatre group we've come from. Um, mm. But I... But they do appreciate risks. Like they Absol- appreciate yeah, absolutely. you like taking a, and you know, what we have that really big thing of like before every show, you know, it's always about like getting each other's backs and stuff, you know, so yeah, yeah. having and that, that trust and just being like, whoa, okay, yeah. you can do and it, that, it's allowed. Yeah, that was, that was certainly something that we almost had to relearn. Mm-hmm. Um, so the, the fundamentals that we were taught from our theatre school were completely invaluable because once you think you have it, (laughs) (laughs) like we had to remind each other, you know, this is not, this is not, we do, we have to trust. And there's so many layers of trust, you know, and to say, "I, I have your back. I'm here for you. I'm here to help you create the scene. Oh, there's so much of yourself sometimes when you're working scenes through continuously, there's so much of yourself that you have to put away. If you truly, truly want to be supportive of your acting partner, you know. So you guys are, um, you developed this show and you put it up. Um, uh, Kudos doing that during COVID though, 
is Australia good? Yeah, it's been it's crazy how like I don't know how much you know about Australia and sort of Australian identity, um, but like it's kind of a trip how there's a mainstream element of S- Australia that really prides itself on being like the larrikin, like the wa- the outlaw, um, you know, one of our like national icons is Ned Kelly, like the bush ranger who like shot at the police and stuff like, you know, big like kind of energy on that. But at the same time, I think that like, you know, Europe, like white Australia was uh, were founded on like convicts you know they were we were like white Australians were like basically prisoners for you know the first like big ch- chunk of time in you know as far as European history of Australia is concerned and that has I think that has trickled down into the way that we responded to COVID where when all of our leaders like you are staying home <laughs> and you are not doing anything we were like okay yes boss <laughs> and like yeah. um and we totally yeah like in Queensland you know they like locked the borders hard when there were other flare-ups in other um parts of the country mm. and you know and everyone was just like oh great we have such a strong leader who will like who will do that <laughs> and um it's like, yeah, so we've definitely appreciated the benefits of it because, yeah, like we, you know, we literally performed a show last night in front of like 40 people in, you know, in a theater that like. That's great. Yeah, it's mind blowing. Like, I, I don't know the next you know, time I'll be able to get into a theater. You know, what I, I know mean? Like, it, mm-hmm. it's yeah, it's really intense. Like, and, you know, it's um, like even when like Melbourne uh, had the most like draconian lockdown, you know, in the, I don't know if it was in the world or whatever, but it was this extended period of time. And so I knew for myself, like putting on shows up in Queensland being like, uh, I'm not really going to promote this on my social media because I don't want to be an asshole to my (laughs) like Melbourne friends (laughs) who are like, you know, I know are locked down and just sort of being like, (laughs) you know, Mm -hmm. um, it's, yeah, it's it's really tricky, but yeah, definitely feel pretty lucky. Like, um, yeah, like. Can I just say that when you were telling the story about the national identity of Australians, I really thought you were going to go the other way. Like, you were like, "We really love this guy who shoots at cops." We're <laughs> from we're from prisoners. I thought you were going to be like, and then they were like, "Here's a rule," and you were like, "We don't care about rules." No, yeah, yeah. Like, that's no. what I really thought you were going to say, and I was like, "Oh <laughs> no. yeah, us too." We're no. all the weird people who were like, "Yeah, I'll get on a boat," or like, "What's a boat?" <laughs> oh no, I'm on a boat, and then that's who's America. Yeah, I always talk about that. I'm like, what What do you think this country was born on? The freaks totally. who were like, I. I gotta get out of Europe. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. get me out of here! Definitely. What? Uh, a four-week boat trip? Yeah, better than my life. Let's go. Like, that's not, yeah. that's not think... really the crowd we want to have as our ancestors, <laughs> is it? But it is. <laughs> so it's like it's definitely gotten somewhere, you know. Like, and that it totally is true. Like when we see America, you know, that's like commitment to freedom <laughs> there. Like, you know, mm-hmm. you're, that's like on the individual level, just being like, nope, I'm going to do whatever the hell I want. <laughs> kind mm-hmm. of vibe. Mm-hmm. And you're like, well, you know, I'm not going to argue with it. Like your whole, like everything it seems was kind of built on this idea of the individual kind of thing. You know, I feel like mm-hmm. I'm learning so much about this city, Brisbane, where we are now. And, you know, the like kind of convict settlement here was like mm. just so brutal like the people mm. were just like mm. beaten into submission yeah, it's, like it's they awful. um you know it's a uh, yeah like it, it's a different kind of vibe I think mm-hmm. like you know it wasn't yeah. until sort of like 60 years on that people actually did start coming um here for pleasure you know what I mean like as in white people coming to this country for like oh yeah I'll come and you know see what's up over there you know for the most part it was just like no you are going to hell like you are going on a however many months boat ride (laughs) 
to mm. you know somewhere where God, it would have you... taken ages yeah <laughs> oh, it, w- man. it was oh. like seven or eight months i cannot you know how when people say things like hey if you could go to another time in history when you when would you go i'm always like no no i'm good <laughs> yeah. like yeah. i have Fine. i have science and airplanes and rights and <laughs> i feel good like i don't yeah. i'm not going back no thank you and i mean like yeah those people who are like oh yeah i'd go back to 60s for the music or whatever but like isn't I, that's what yeah, we have the music. <laughs> like we can, mm, yeah, it exists with us now. So yeah, yeah, we've got it. If you is that all, is that all you're going reflect, back for? Yeah, if you want to reflect on the political strife of the '60s, just keep watching U.S. news. You'll you'll yeah. find yeah. it. It's fine. Yeah, yeah. It's available. It hasn't gone We're here anywhere. For you. No, <laughs> Write no. some folk songs about us, and there you go. Same. There we go. We got Finished. it. Finished. Exactly. Done. The '60s. Yeah. We're here again. Yeah, completely. <laughs> <laughs> crazy yeah. but oh man um, well, i'm glad that you guys were able to have your show and that you're able to continue to do stuff is the mm. improv theater back in full swing as well um pretty they, much yeah like i mean now they've broken up for christmas sure, um, sure, sure. but they um yeah like they were the f- ones who sort of dipped their toes back out and you know for a little while there it was like um you know they're like big four friday shows which like i used to just love like we used to just cram like as many people as we can into them was Mm. you know down to sort of like 20 people were allowed in the room and you know you had a cast of like five Mm. um you know, um, and then, yeah, it's, I'm pretty sure it didn't get, I think it might have gotten up to like 30 people were allowed maybe by the end of the <laughs> year. Because mm. um, it was a pretty small, th- it's a pretty small theater space um, where there were. And um, yeah, so it's, it's just kind of slowly but surely, like I, when we locked down and they, I was so grateful that like, the big folk people went on to zoom like stream to youtube shows like and jams and training and stuff like pretty much immediately and you know i know for myself i just got like right on that like because myself being like a, a really former like it was such a challenge just sort of sitting in the chair <laughs> and like listening <laughs> and like trying to just build the relationships <laughs> and respond and all of that sort of stuff and like I loved even just like playing with the like the webcam camera like I'd lift up the laptop and like swing it around and like bring it to and forward like for dynamicism and it was like yeah just to kind of keep going and keep working and knowing that you know a handful of people were watching on the live stream to YouTube kind of thing was, you know, kind of all I needed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The Zoom explosion is uh, wild. And the international improv connection that has happened, I mean, like like we were talking about earlier, Asia, I think you and I met Mm -hmm. on a Facebook group for international improvisers. And it was like, like, what a wild group. And like, how did we ever speak to one another? And then I know, like, how did you even like find us? Like what well the beauty of it is that, you know, where the world got a little bit smaller when everyone had Mm. to be on zoom and Mm. theaters Mm. have taken the harshest hit of anybody so they're like yeah we're artists we're good we're gonna reinvent the entire thing and now Mm. like every day at every hour of the day you could probably find an improv jam just in a different Mm -hmm. country like you're like Mm -hmm. ah it's a little late tonight here in texas but uh what time is it in india because maybe they got something going on right Mm -hmm. so there's like whole big group that you can connect to now and it's just so beautiful Mm -hmm. that it exists and that we can all connect to one another so my like Mm -hmm. focus Mm -hmm. is usually on the positive as far as like yeah this is a rough time but like the we have I've been connected to other improvisers in such Mm -hmm. a wide swath that it's like I'm so excited and so happy Mm -hmm. to be connected with all of you and everyone um you know 
and all the international communities that now I just happen to be like chatting with every day and like seeing really? on Zoom occasionally. And it's like, what? I love it. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. And yeah, you, you literally, I think you're exactly right that, you know, when things just kind of appear like problems kind of appear there are they like to have these kind of positives come out of it like mm. you know we knew for ourselves like what, learning from the um d- big folk directors about how it, crucial it was that we got across to the improv olympic you know and trained in chicago and mm-hmm. stuff like to then be like whoa these guys are running like online jams like we can, <laughs> we can get in on that, you know i think yeah. they might have closed down now but yeah um yeah, I was like, yeah, I don't know tricky. how Io is handling the uh, whole thing. I don't even know how Chicago's handling it right now. Um, but uh, but it's very interesting that the whole theater was born from um, Io and the sort of Del Close style because you know I, I don't I don't catch that a lot in other countries. Um, most people are are not focused on that kind of thing. But hey, it's so super cool, and I love the idea that these guys were so inspired. They like went on a trip and then came back and were like, guys, let me tell you, like those that's the best. Like mm. improv evangelists are my favorite. <laughs> yeah, that's you know for us like I remember when like one of the directors Jim he could tell that I was like really soaking everything up and stuff and he was like oh we got a theorist here we got we got like so he like quickly got me the truth in comedy and like I you know I went away and like devoured that and you know um yeah it's, it's been so lucky news and the people have been here in like you know what is a pretty small city you know, mm. and there's this community here where people are like, yeah, hell yeah. Like, come on, Del Close. Mm-hmm. Like, <laughs> man. Hey, man, from what I hear from people who have who met him back in the day, he was, you know, engaging in a way that nobody was, you know, like yeah. some people mm-hmm. are just draw you to them and, you know, have a vibe that everyone wants to be part of. And, you know, this guy was it. So mm-hmm. they they burn hot and they burn fast and then they're gone. And it's like, wow what happened (laughs) but you know i've talked to a bunch of people i've talked to improvisers of all ages and um it's always interesting to be like wait you took a class with del close and they're like yeah i'm like okay now we need to get into that like (laughs) um i know that you're very i know that you're like famous for various other things but this is what i want to talk about Um, and it's also fun too to be to talk to you guys about stuff because like that's the same style that I was trained in as well right so it's like oh wow we're oh more connected than I thought you know and not to say that like I would ever do the kind of show that you guys did you guys are your show about vulnerability and performing naked as a choice uh, is such an intense and amazing choice and clearly born out of the you know deep artists that both of you are which is really great i'm glad that you have each other because like you can like inspire each other and create Mm -hmm. these projects that's so that's so awesome um Mm -hmm. my final question to you guys um is to ask about you know what advice do you have for other improvisers maybe right now in the world that are trying to create like what how do you like tap into creating your own show whether it be able to be in front of people or online like right now such a crazy time how did you tap into creating this when the world was like so insane (laughs) i think um one i feel as though it's like um looking inside like looking into the relationships like i guess i'm learning where i'm at with improv at the moment is just like everything is about the relationship that you're building with your, you know, with the other character in the space, mm. you know? Mm-hmm. And um, and so I guess 
just like really zoning in on that and finding like the truth in the connection between those two characters, even if they're like totally really big, goofy, silly characters kind of thing, finding that. Yeah. Or, or even, even if they're the opposite of that. Mm. And then, um, and then as far as like getting a show up, like, you know, I think that, I mean, all I feel like we could say is to just like, you know, put the timer on, like do it for, see how it feels to actually just go for an hour and then be like, okay, well, what if we, what if we added a bit of structure to that so that there was some, you know, some ups and downs that, you know, we're already sort of there that we can then bounce off against, Mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Like, um, like just sort of feeling the time itself, like is, Mm -hmm. feels like a really important Thing as far as just kind of understanding the nature of a show and then the final thing that I would say would be just like watching as much improv as possible you know mm. yeah 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 like then it absorbs so much and you know on an intellectual level um and I think why we come together so well is because I'm very I don't know just bluntly practical <laughs> I, I, I would, I would say, you know, you, you, you're, you're sort of saying, you know, at a time like this, and maybe we haven't sort of struggled with COVID as much as America is is unfortunately struggling right now. But, um, but I'm always glass glass half full, you know. It's always half full. The world's always have had problems and epidemics, and uh, and there's always going to be a boogeyman waiting to get you, always. That it's just inevitable, but if if you if you're just gonna see the world, and 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 see uh, your insecurities and and see failure, <laughs> then you might as well not get out of bed, and and you so so book the hall, you know, or book the time, you know you got it you gotta be ballsy about it, and then and then and then book the times in when you're gonna rehearse. When are you going to do it? All right, we're going to do it for this, at this time every week, you know, for the for the next ten weeks, and then we perform on this date. You know, just 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 dive in head first, and and sometimes you know you you'll end up diving in and and uh, and uh, and un- underestimating or uh, um, how shallow the water is and breaking your neck. You know, and becoming a quad- quadriplegic. It could be disastrous. <laughs> <laughs> everything, everything that can go wrong could go wrong. Absolutely. But then, you know, could flip the other way completely. Don't be one of those like, oh, pussy faced people. <laughs> I'm going to get on my soapbox now. But that's just like, no, oh, well, I don't know. You know, and then all of a sudden it's two months later and you're still going, oh, I don't know. <laughs> Because what what's the point? Yeah. You know, make make those bold decisions, make those bold moves. Um, because who knows? I mean, the world could go up in flames tomorrow, and then what? Or next Wednesday. Or next Wednesday. <laughs> um, that's that's how I live my life. Flames. So uh, yeah, like I mean, um, as much as we our process, I think for for putting on for for. Uh, embodying a show from beginning to end is very different um but and and ben you seem to you you i know you 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 think of of structure and the actual show but like at the end of the day i just think it's optimism and commitment to each other to yourself to the world around us you know um <sighs> And this is, I feel like these are really big there. answers to this <laughs> like yeah. wrap up no, question. No, they're great. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I just feel, I just feel like, uh, you know, there, there'd be some people like we haven't been improvising for very long at all. You don't have to wait 10 years to do this. Mm. Exactly. And it was, and it was totally. a successful show. It was, you know, mm. we, we, we sold out on two nights and, you know, the third note was full. Um, we, you you can't as much as refining craft is important and and doing it with um respect to 
the elder gods of um, of comedy. Um, <laughs> it, it, it still it still it still is is a matter of just just doing it. There's not mm. enough bravery. I find there's there's a little bit of timidity uh, amongst peers sometimes, and they don't just get out there and do it. And I'm just saying, and and that's not a that's not a negative judgment on them. It's just like, come on, guys, you can do it. You can do anything. You can have anything you want. You know, you, you just gotta yeah. try. Can I just say that the phrase elder gods of comedy has really like gotten me going like in my head I'm imagining like these huge like Greek god looking like like statues but like they're sitting on like whoopee cushions and, like, yeah yeah you know? yes, they're, 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 they're smoking weed and yeah. And, uh, it's like it's like two statues are high fiving each other. You're like, what's yeah. happening? Like, yeah. Yeah. oh my god, that's so funny. No, these are great answers. No, I really these this is excellent advice. Um, uh, both both of you from your own points of view, uh, how to get it done, and you you talked about it. You know, also I think it's an excellent point Asia's making that like you guys haven't been doing it that often yet. You were like, I want to make a show, so you did it that mm. the action is doing it getting it done Barely. right people aren't in improv because they're like let's plan a lot of stuff kind of people they're actually yeah. right you want to plan a lot of stuff write a play get a play produced that'll take you yeah. multiple years if you'd like to wait <laughs> like but you know if you want to do something fast improv is the way right yeah absolutely awesome yeah Thank you guys so much. Thank you, Ben and Asia, for being on the podcast. I really appreciate you guys taking time out of your day to talk to me and share your stories. It has been really great to talk to you and to hear yeah. what's going on. Thank you so much. You. It's been such a pleasure talking to you. And um, yeah, thanks so much for having us. Yeah. Thanks for listening to Yes But Why Podcast. Check out all our episodes on yesbutwhypodcast.com or check out all the content on our network, HC Universal, at hcuniversalnetwork.com.